Dr. Mather, welcome. Thank you so much for being here uh, to field questions. It looks like we've got a few already in the Q&A box if you want to pop that open and address them. Right. Well, thank you for, for having me. It's so great to be here and it's so great to see all these people participating and, and tuning in. You know, this was a talk I think that um, we initially gave uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And so to to come and revisit it um, is quite something and, and to see where we've all come collectively since uh, since that time. So I get one. How do you comment on which is a dominant stricture if there are any in uh, PSC? I think it's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of people who who sort of uh, have their own definition of what a dominant stricture is. Um, and there's probably something in the literature that really defines it, uh, you know, uh, more effectively. But you know, you just sort of look at it, and um, if there's any stricture, usually about a centimeter in its length, you know, that's the one that you start to worry about. I it's obviously going to be a, at the end of the day, an arbitrary number because everything starts off much smaller and becomes bigger, but about a centimeter, you start to take notice. If one of the strictures is getting worse, if there's increasing upstream dilatation from one of the strictures, you got to worry about that one. I think the narrowing itself is, you know, is what it is, but uh, you want to look at everything else, right? Look at the soft tissue, if anything around, look at the degree of enhancement. Um, and, and if, and if those features are sort of, um, worse than they were previously, then I think, uh, you know, that's something you need to worry about. How mm -hmm. to differentiate segmental polypoid thick bile from polyp on ultrasound? So I don't know if I um if I'm a hundred percent clear on the question. Certainly you have you know gallbladder polyp, so that's one thing you're asking. And the other is just segmental thickening of the of the wall of the gallbladder, perhaps, or am I missing um a uh, a specific terminology here? Oh, thick sludge from polyp. Perfect. Okay. And so, um, you know, you look at the morphology. So polyps, you know, we call them polyp because they have a polypoid morphology, right? The little ball appearance protruding into the lumen. And so, you know, you look at all the modalities, right? So if you start with ultrasound, if you see sort of a, a ball-like lesion that's protruding into the lumen, we're going to think about it um, to be a, a gallbladder polyp. Sludge typically layers, but you're absolutely right that, uh, you know, sludge can have a tumefactive appearance or tumor-like appearance. Usually it's a little bit larger. Usually it's more lobulated in its appearance. Um, on ultrasound, you're going to put color and um, and you're going to see if there's flow. Uh, you're going to try to optimize it to see if, uh, you know, to look for low flow. I think uh, even so, sometimes it's difficult on ultrasound to pick up really, really slow flow. So then you really have to go to MR to differentiate, um, you know, tumefactive sludge from polyps. And tumefactive sludge, you know, you do a nice, good quality MR, you know, you're not going to see any enhancement within it. Uh, and when we say no enhancement, it looks essentially black. If you see any degree of gray within it, it means it has some low level enhancements. You're dealing with a cancer, you know, potentially a polyp. And those are the sort of things you look for. Um, another question had come up, I think, in the chat box. I'll go there first and then come back to the Q&A. When do you use hepatobiliary contrast? What's your best agent if needed, in your opinion? Um, so hepatobiliary contrast, you know, I think uh, the real um, utility of it, there's sort of two utilities, usually to to, to help you with liver masses, um, to help you differentiate perhaps an FNH from everything else. Um, even so, there, as you may know, there's a lot of overlaps, uh, you know, not a lot of overlap, but there is overlap in that some adenoma, some hepatocellular carcinomas will take up um, the uh, the agent, uh, you know, eovist in this instance and, and not excrete it. So it'll be hyper intense, but you know the truth of the matter is those are are generally uh, uncommon. And so if you just want to think about it in practical terms, if you have a mass that looks like an FNH and other sequences and takes up the hepatobiliary reagent, it's probably going to be an FNH as opposed to an atypical presentation of an adenoma or a hepatocellular carcinoma. So I think that would be one good use for hepatobiliary contrast agents. Another good use would be um, our surgeons sometimes like it prior to doing a. Uh, liver resection for, for metastases, so segmentectomies or hip, you know, when they take out individual lesions, they want to delineate every single uh, lesion uh, in the liver. And so they use the hepatobiliary agent you image at 20 minutes to see them as little black holes so they can really pick up all those lesions. And so that's another reason um, why we use hepatobiliary agents. Um, you know, I suppose if you're looking for bile leak, it's of utility as well. And so we've done that a few times. Sometimes it works when we see contrast come out, sometimes we don't actually. So uh, there's no harm in trying it. But typically for bio leaks, you know, uh, there are enough um, clues, perhaps in other imaging modalities and the clinical picture that you can, you can 
figure out its bioleak without having to do a hepatobiliary contrast, uh, um, use a hepatobiliary contrast agent. And I suppose the only other thing we use for hepatobiliary contrast agents is when we are um, preoperative liver MR, we want to map out the biliary anatomy, and we want to make sure there's no variance, uh, we use our hepatobiliary contrast agents for that as well. So let's see what else we have. Uh, so two questions on the same topic about differentiating, uh, you know, the mucinous cystic uh, liver lesions, uh, cystad, thormonoid biliary cystadenomas from simple cyst. Um, and so, yeah, those are going to be very tough. You know, I just, in fact, we just had a case um, uh, this morning about how to differentiate. And I went through that conversation with my trainee and it's going to be tough. Typically, when you look at these hepatic mucinous cystic neoplasms, they tend to be isolated in the sense that you only see a liver cyst. You don't see any other cysts uh, within the liver. Um, so I think about it in that instance, typically, you know, it's a larger size, maybe four to five centimeters, borders a little lobulated, maybe a few septations. Um, and so I think, and in, in, and in the right patient population, which is typically a, a female about the age of 50 or above. And so if you see those um, imaging features, isolated cysts, lobulated border septations in a female of that age group, you want to bring up the possibility of uh, hepatic mucinous cyst, uh, cystic neoplasm. Obviously, if you see solid components, you're going to think of the malignant counterpart. Um, but again, these are uncommon things. So common things being common, it may end up just being a cyst that looks a little bit, you know, lobulated and septated. But normally, I would pass most of those cysts. But if it's isolated, lobulated borders, septations in the right age group, I suggest that possibility. And for those patients, they often maybe see a surgeon, the surgeon doesn't necessarily take them out okay, and unless uh, the cyst is causing uh, some symptoms and they'll just follow them maybe at a few, um, you know, a couple of month intervals, six months or one year intervals to make sure things are are, do, are going okay. So do you know diffusion imaging and gallbladder and biliary malignancy? That's a great question. You know, um, I think if you read the literature, you're always going to find um, folks who write about the utility of diffusion weighted imaging in, in all uh, applications in the abdomen and pelvis, certainly with things like prostate, I find it essential, right? Um, and, and even for liver imaging, uh, it can be helpful for pancreas imaging, it could be helpful. But the honest truth is maybe it's just our group, but... Um, we, we don't really find it that useful. I mean, it could be useful if you're looking for um, you know, restricted diffusion and abscesses or perhaps a, a malignancy with cells that are packed in together. But I have to say, you know, uh, you can probably come up with that diagnosis more often than not based on the other imaging sequences. So that the diffusion perhaps may be only useful if you don't have a good T2, if you don't have a good post-contrast sequence, and maybe then the diffusion can help. But um, if you have good sequences other than that, I don't know if it helps too much. Uh, personally to, to sort of tease out what the diagnosis is. Adenomyosis versus gallbladder cholesterolosis. Yeah, adenomyosis, um, I think it's sort of a, you know, I once remember reading cholesterolosis was sort of a pathologic diagnosis when you open up the gallbladder and you see all these cholesterol deposits. I think it's going to be tough on imaging. Usually adenomyosis, you know, it can be diffuse, but oftentimes it's more focal as opposed to cholesterolosis, which tends to be more diffuse. But I think uh, differentiating that um, specifically on imaging, I think will be difficult. If I recall, it might be more a pathologic uh, diagnosis. I could be wrong on that. Can it be adenomyosis and fundus without ring shadow and how to differentiate sludge accumulation and tumor? So I think if you're going to call adenomyomatosis in the fundus, you're going to, you know, and you want to call it definitively, you're going to want to have all the imaging features of it, which is, you know, focal thickening with some echogenic foci, which are the cholesterol crystals with ring shadow. For me, if I don't see all of that, I'm going to try to get another imaging modality because clearly, you know, a tumor in that location can um, can have that appearance and sludge just lying there can have that appearance. And how do you differentiate that? You know, um, get an MR. MR will show enhancement within a tumor, no enhancement within sludge. Um, and so that hopefully can help out in that instance. So, uh, somebody asked about declare impending perforation. Gallbladder set up to 100 cc's in volume. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, I haven't actually used that term. I'm not sure if that's something you use, but um I, I certainly think if it's 100 cc's in volume, it's a, it's a pretty large gallbladder. And so um, I don't know if I'd use that in my report necessarily. You know, perforation to me is a binary thing. You either perforate or they're not perforated. You never know when something is going to perforate. But um, I may not use that in my dictation, but I would certainly call my referring provider, say, hey, this gallbladder is really distended. And if you don't do something right now, uh, you know, it may pop and, and perforate. Can central and peripheral cholangic carcinoma occur at the same time? You know, um, I haven't seen, I don't recall seeing that happen. Um, I suppose it can. And I suppose you can have, uh, you know, instances of multifocal cholangio, right, happening in the um, periphery and in the ducts. But, um, you know, I don't have numbers on that, but it can certainly happen, but it's not something that I don't think happens. It doesn't happen that often. 
when do you say CBD is dilated in young, old, and post-cholecystectomy patients? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know if there's updated literature on this, but I, I think most people in our group and, and, and when I've gone to conferences talk about, you know, top normal of six, and then you add a centimeter, you know, uh, six millimeters for uh, at 60, and then you add a millimeter every decade after that. Um, post-cholecystectomy, you know, I've seen so much variety where, you know, post-cholecystectomy patients have normal bile ducts or they could be dilated. Um, I think stability is your friend there. If it's stable over a period of time, you probably assume it's due to the post-cholecystectomy status. If um, things get worse over a period of time, then then perhaps get an MR to make sure there's no obstructing lesion uh, in the ampulla. Okay. Another question about 10-minute delayed scan for a cholangiocarcinoma. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're worried about a cholangiocarcinoma, the 10-minute delayed even on a CT scan would be essential. So you want to try to modify the protocol to accommodate that. Uh, how to report gallbladder with posterior shadowing. So I think um, perhaps you're asking about uh, maybe a porcelain gallbladder where you have sort of calcifications and shadowing uh, that's drowning it out. I think it's very tough. I mean, if you have a shadowing that's precluding you from seeing the gallbladder, you say, you know, I can't really evaluate it. And yeah. again, you're going to have to get another imaging modality if they're worried about gallbladder pathology. What key features you look for confidently call acute cholangitis on CT and MR? I think it's a great yeah. question. I mean, really looking for um, wall thickening of the bile ducts as well as hyper enhancement. So areas of the bile ducts, wall that are enhancing more than other areas. If it's all diffusely enhancing, then it becomes a little bit difficult, but you're really looking for that wall thickening and hyper enhancement um, to suggest acute cholangis, cholangitis. If a gallbladder fossa shows posterior shadow, how to describe it? Do we say likely calculi? Yeah, I think you're going to have to look at it carefully, right? So, you know, if it's clean shadowing, it could be, you know, look for the gallbladder wall echo, you know, the, the wall echo shadow complex. If it's dirty shadowing, you know, you want to be worried about, is there some air in the gallbladder wall or is there some bowel gas that's precluding it? My whole thing is, listen, if I can't clear the gallbladder because of shadowing, um, uh, then, you you know, you may want to get an MR. I mean, I see an MR for a lot of things, but, you know, it is really a problem-solving tool. And if you're worried about the gallbladder, but you can't evaluate an ultrasound, you got to get something else to in order for you to look at it better. And that's just that's just the way things go. A 10-minute delayed scan only in peripheral cholangiocarcinoma on central? No, I would get a 10-minute delayed in any patients you're looking for a cholangiocarcinoma. The um, hyper-enhancement, a relative hyper-enhancement on the 10-minute delayed image yeah. will be present with peripheral and central lesions. Perhaps it'll be more evident on peripheral lesions because they're more mass-like and they're embedded, sort of have liver parenchyma that surrounds it. So you'll see it um, a little bit better than in the central ones where you don't have that liver parenchyma around it. But regardless, um, if you look at it objectively, should be brighter on the 10 minutes delayed um, due to that fibrosis within these lesions. And so I think that, uh, you know, getting the 10 minute delay would be essential no matter where you're looking for, for cholangiocarcinoma. Thank yeah. you everybody for your engagement. Um, hope this was useful and uh, I look forward to, uh, to meeting you and engaging with you uh, uh, in the near future.